Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Amy King, Senior Managing Editor at KGL Editorial. And today I'll be giving a very brief overview, uh, reviewing what's been done, what guidelines and resources are available, what we can do, and how KGL can help with diversity, equity, and inclusion in scholarly communications. I'll begin by giving an overview of the DEI efforts in scholarly pu publishing with a historical timeline starting back in 2017. So over the last six to seven years, there have been increasing calls for action on DEI with regards to sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and geography in scientific publishing. In 2017 is when C4DISC came together. That's the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly uh, Communications. It was founded by 10 different trade and professional associations that represent organizations and individuals working in scholarly communications. Then in 2018, Publons produced a global state of peer review report, and it showed that editors disproportionately select reviewers from their own region, and that male authors and editors suggest and select fewer female reviewers as compared to female authors and editors. And this was a bit of a wake up call for the scholarly publishing industry to see that something really needed to be done about this bias. Then ALPSP, which is the Association of Learned and Professional Society Publishers introduced its diversity and inclusivity manifesto in 2018. And then really between that time and 2022, many different journals, societies, and publishers began to disclose demographic data regarding who their editors were, who their authors and reviewers were, and started to publish their own calls to address editorial bias and to increase editor, reviewer, and author diversity. So in September of 2020, CSE, the Council of Science Editors, formed a DEI task force, and they became a standing committee in 2021. They've since developed a website with many resources. Then in November of 2021, the Joint Commitment for Action on Inclusion and Diversity in Publishing was established. And we'll take a look at that in the next slide to see who participates, but it's a very broad industry coalition and they established minimum standards for inclusion and diversity in scholarly publishing. Then in October of 2022, C4DISC, one of the organizations that really kicked off the efforts back in 2017, published guidelines on inclusive language and images and scholarly communication, and also produced its anti-racism toolkit for organizations. Then just in July of this year, C4DISC launched a new DEIA community of practice for individuals to come together from all different organizations in scholarly publishing to talk about and discuss how they're implementing their DEIA initiatives. And in this case, the A stands for accessibility. So we'll look at the minimum standards that were established in a moment, but first, who is part of this joint commitment? Uh, this is a very extensive group, and you can see that there are a wide variety of publishers here. KGL works with many of them, and they come together, they came together and began working on putting together a policy document that would make standards for DEI in publishing. And uh, now we're going to take a look ex at exactly what they came up with. So again, this was back in November of 2021 that this was published, uh, their statement here, and their joint commitment for action on inclusion, inclusion and diversity in publishing has these six minimum standards. Number one was ensure inclusion and diversity are integrated into publishing activities and strategic planning. Second, to work to understand the demographic diversity of authors editorial decision makers and reviewers. Third, to acknowledge the barriers within publishing, which authors, editorial decision makers and reviewers from underrepresented communities experience, and then take actions to address them. Fourth was to define and communicate specific responsibilities that authors, editors and reviewers have toward inclusion and diversity. Fifth 
review and revise as appropriate the appointment process for editors and editorial boards to capture the widest talent pool possible. And then finally, to publicly report on progress on inclusion and diversity at least once a year. So besides the joint commitment, C4DISC, which I've mentioned is another organization that has excellent resources for publishers. Some of the founding professional associations uh, are shown here. And C4DISC resources and guidelines that are available are listed here. And they are working on additional resources on an ongoing basis. There is a lot to consider in DEI, especially when starting out. So what is a good place to start? Well, at the society level, we can support DEI in staffing, collect and report demographic information. We can set goals and we can increase training opportunities. So going into a bit more detail, more specifically, societies can consider the results of the C4DISC workplace equity survey. So C4DISC did a survey of societies and they found that the workforce in societies is highly imbalanced within scholarly publishing. 96% have a bachelor's degree or higher, 76% of staff are female in society and journal staffing, 83% are heterosexual, 81% are white, 89% report no disabilities. Outcomes, and this is career outcomes, diverge for respondents based on their gender and ethnicity. The leadership profile in societies and publishers is much more male, 33% versus 21%, and it's more white, 91% versus 81% than the sample as a whole. So one of the action points as a society is to develop plans to recruit, retain, and promote a more diverse workforce. And we won't have time to go into detail about all of the things societies can do, but one more is collecting and reporting on demographic information. Many people are not forthcoming with this information, so you will need to be very clear on why you are collecting this data. You can ask your system users or survey your authors, editors, and reviewers, not only about their geographic location, but also their racial and ethnic identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, level of degree, or year of degree. You can publish an annual report on your journal's diversity, and you can establish accountability measures for improvement of diversity year over year. I also want to look at what editorial boards can do specifically to foster DEI. So aside from the society, editorial boards themselves also need to be engaged in this effort. And editorial boards should address unconscious bias, recognize non-inclusive language and images. They can diversify article commissioning, reduce bias in the reviewer selection process, increase the diversity of reviewer pools, study examples of DEI success among other journals, and appoint a lead editor for diversity and inclusion. I won't have time to go into detail about each item here today, but we'll look more deeply at the first point of addressing unconscious bias. So editorial boards can take courses to help with bias awareness and understanding. You can research this yourself within your board or bring in an organization that can help teach the board about the various levels and types of bias that affect their work. And there are many different kinds of bias, but a few that particularly plague scholarly publishing are affinity bias, attribution bias, and confirmation bias. Underlying assumptions can be very difficult to pinpoint on one's own, and one way to help examine them is to take implicit association tests. While there has been some controversy about Harvard's freely available implicit association tests, and not everyone believes that the results are fully valid, it can be helpful to take them together as a board. In these tests, you're given a number of associations that you need to go through fairly quickly. There are tests that have to do with bias regarding many different areas, including race, geography, weight, gender, career, religion, sexuality, and more. 
taking these tests can help start conversations among the board about bias. So again, these implicit bias tests are not universally agreed upon as accurate, but they are a worthwhile exercise for the board to take and discuss results. This can help the board address bias in the reviewer selection process as well. The board can consider updating author guidelines to suggest diverse reviewers, avoid reaching out to known reviewers and rely more on content matching, and if appropriate, considering asking reviewers to evaluate based on research quality rather than on novelty or significance to encourage unique contributions to the literature. And many journals have taken these steps both on the society level and the board level already and are continuing this slow yet rewarding work. So how can KGL help? KGL Editorial brings expertise in active involvement in professional societies and brings extensive experience with training editors, reviewers. Societies and boards have often required training to help them with this process. And some of the elements of DEI training include uh, a review of disparities research in scholarly publishing, reviewing now widely adopted DEI guidelines, unconscious bias assessment and instruction, inclusive language and image instruction, diversity assessments, editorial policy assessments, reviewer training guidance and support, and reviewing DEI successes among journals and societies. So KGL trainings include all of these elements and provide implicit, implicit bias training, inclusive language and images training, and guidance on diversifying editorial boards and reviewer pools. So thank you all for your attention. And now I'll hand it over to Vanessa. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Vaughn. We're gonna do just a quick presentation swap. And hopefully you are now seeing my screen. Great, so hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Vaughn. I am KGL Senior Director of Content Services in the K-12 space. And I'm going to be chatting a little bit as a follow-up about uh, DEI in K-12 educational content. Uh, this is a brief talk. Obviously, you can learn more about this topic by reviewing a white paper that we have on our website, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Educational Content, What You Need to Know Now. We've just recently updated this, and it's a great read, so check it out. So what is what we are calling CDEI in the K-12 space? So the K-12 work that we do, obviously, is a little different than what might be done in a scholarly publication. So in K-12 work, really what we're doing is applying the principles of DEI to the content that KGL develops in conjunction with publishers to present to students, teachers in the classroom, and then, you know, by extension, their families and the world at large. This has been a movement in K-12 for quite some time. It's become more formalized in recent years, and there's really been an increased focus on inclusion and representation. And that can be the inclusion, of course, of different racial and ethnic groups, of folks of different sexual orientations and gender identities, but even things like family structure, um, socioeconomic status, disability status. There's lots of ways that we can include more people in our content. And this, like I said, is a reflection of just the evolution of thinking about this. We're really meeting all of our users where they are. And we see this being applied in various ways across the various content areas that KGL works in. For example, in language arts, there's been increased interest in representing diverse authors in the text that might be produced for a K-12 classroom program in order to ensure the authenticity of character voices. Uh, in social studies, there has long been an effort to bring in more stories from people whose stories were not necessarily being told. And that has been, again, just more expanded more expanded and more formalized to help students understand the various experiences and viewpoints that make up historical interpretation. 
And even in things that you might not think so much of having a content effort with DEI, like in the STEM fields, there's been more attention in recent years on representing the contributions of scientists from underrepresented groups of showing that STEM is for everyone and not just for the idea that people might have of a scientist. And why does this matter? Uh, you know, in, in K-12, we reach so many different students across the whole country, you know, sometimes across the world. And in the United States, especially, there's been demographic shifts that mean that inclusion in content simply makes it more representative of the student body that we talk to. The U.S. Census Bureau estimates that about half of all young people 17 and under will identify as non-white by 2030, which is right around the corner. And already about 30% of that same age group are people who live in non-traditional households. So household family structures that are not married opposite sex parents. You know, this ranges from students being raised in a single parent household, folks that might live with grandparents, um, children of same sex couples. And of course you wanna reach out and engage with students in ways that are reflective of their lives and their experiences because it not only just makes them more interested it makes the content more relevant for them. It engages them you know, greater in the learning process and that in turn can lead to improved performance. There've been a lot of studies, this has been going on now for many years in assessment, for example, that what is uh, known as culturally responsive assessments or assessments that incorporate CDI principles uh, offer students a way to demonstrate more authentically and more accurately their skills and knowledge without relying perhaps on prior knowledge from a cultural context. And that can be things as simple as uh, not all students celebrate all holidays. So if you provided, for example, a reading passage to a student and asked them questions about a holiday that they don't celebrate, a student who does know about that holiday might do better than a student who didn't already know about that holiday. And we want to make things as fair and unbiased, as accurate as possible. And applying CDEI is a way to get us there. Uh, in the K-12 world, the content that we develop really is driven a lot by what different states would like us to do based on their standards. States have expectations for what their students learn and educational materials have to meet those standards in order to be adopted and be presented in classrooms much of the time. So for example, California in a recent year uh, implemented a new requirement for ethnic studies uh, to help students understand the diversity of the state. So now there will be a bigger push to create K-12 ethnic studies material to support that need. And of course, as we all know, there's just changing expectations of the public who are the ultimate users of all K-12 programs to be better about DEI, to be more inclusive, to have greater representation. There are some exceptions to that rule. I think we've all heard about some of the notable state level efforts to limit the expansion of content DEI. Florida comes up a lot in this uh, quite Famously, not too long ago, Florida rejected many, many math programs for saying that they included barred topics. Uh, both Florida and Texas have passed legislation banning discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity in certain classroom situations. Florida has also passed what's called the Stop Woke Act in 2022 that limits conversation around things like racism and sexism and national origin. In many circumstances, you can discuss it, but you can't endorse a viewpoint. And there's um, I think a lack of clarity around how that will be uh, interpreted. A lot of states have passed legislation on what they call critical race theory. No K-12 program could ever teach critical race theory. There's not enough pages in the book, but sometimes there's confusion around again what that is. So there's been some efforts to limit that. And of course, for decades, there's been controversy around what a school library might have in stock for students to read independently. And we have seen some expansion of bans, again, a lot of them in places like Florida, over what topics may or may not be there. So there is still some limitation around the use of CDEI in the classroom, but that is generally the exception rather than the rule. So knowing that CDEI is the way that the industry is moving, how can we focus on it? Um, it kind of like Amy was saying, it's a joint effort. It's not just the work of content writers and content editors. It's also the work of illustrators, of art researchers, of designers, of people who work with accessibility to ensure that our all of our students are able to access the content to support equity goals. 
because this has been an evolving process, there is a critical need for there to be ongoing reviews of uh, stated publishing standards and guidelines, style guides. There's often conversation around very specific word choices relating to identity and groups of people. And sometimes the uh, preferred approach for that can evolve. So keeping abreast of that is really helpful. That's a place where KGL comes in and works with publishers regularly to help keep an eye on the guidelines, to give feedback. Uh, recently, there's been more of an interest, and this is building again on a thing that's gone on for some time, to engage stakeholders from various groups in order to weigh in on those guidelines, to review that content, to ensure appropriateness and authenticity. Uh, for example, the Anti-Defamation League uh, produces a set of guidelines around Holocaust education that are widely used in K-12 classrooms. And providing that insight from various groups can just help make the content more in line with CDEI goals. And increasingly, there's been a separate review stage that's been added with resources who, again, could come from those stakeholder groups who've had training to formalize that process and really make sure that things are being done to the best standard possible. There's obviously many challenges to this process, but also it's very rewarding. Uh, some of the difficulties, again, like Amy was talking about, there's a lack of diversity in the staffing and the pools of writers and the pools of illustrators that work on these kinds of materials. And that's been an ongoing expansion effort to include more people in that conversation so that we can support those outcomes. Obviously, writing guidelines, staying on top of them, making changes that might need to be made is time consuming. It requires a lot of specialized knowledge and training. There are, particularly in K-12, because there is so much attention on textbooks in the classroom, the risks of getting it wrong are very great. There's a lot of reputational damage that can be done if a publisher does not quite get it right and there's, I think, everybody has seen examples of this pop up in the news. There's been a lot of conversation around the way that we talk about slavery, for example. And when those things are not done well, then the public perception of that can really damage um, the whole view of the program, the view of the publisher, and in some ways, the view of the topic and the subject and the way that it's taught by everyone. So there's a very big incentive for everyone to do the best they can. And along with that, there are the simple rewards that having a greater diversity of voices and being more inclusive leads to better programs. Going back to the language arts example, if you think about a K-12 language arts textbook, something you might've read in high school, it would be a lot more interesting just to read a lot of different kinds of texts by a lot of different kinds of authors than only reading traditional texts from the Western canon. So diversity, equity, and inclusion here is not just a principle and a goal, it's a pedagogical improvement. Uh, again, helping students be more engaged with the content and making connections with what they're learning helps them have greater understanding. It helps build critical thinking skills. So it's great for student outcomes. And because this is a thing that is happening across the market, it helps grow the program's market share if they can show that they're meeting these goals appropriately. And that's a place that um, in the classroom can be very competitive. And just as a content creator, I think speaking for all of us at KGL and across the industry, helping to make programs better is our passion. So working with something like CDEI in order to improve better programs is deeply rewarding and it just helps you be better at what you do. So speaking of KGL and CDEI, here's a brief listing of some of the things that we have been doing to support DEI outcomes in our content and you know, we'll continue to do in the future. We help publishers with their guidelines development, reviews and feedbacks. We can do prototyping, not just of text, but also of illustrations and visuals. We're very active in passage development and narrative and assessment development that adheres to CDEI principles. We do have those kinds of DEI reviewers that can perform necessary tasks. As DEI is moving into state standards and frameworks, we do a lot of standards alignment and gap analysis to ensure that programs that exist meet those goals, or if not, what they need to do in order to get there. Um, as I mentioned, we do work with photo and art research. We're working on an illustration program right now that's very focused on helping with CDEI. And one thing that we're seeing increasingly 
when we do say a classroom video or a short animation is an interest in matching up a character that might just be a cartoon character with a voiceover actor of the same race or ethnicity of an appropriate age in order to create the best and most authentic experience for students. So that wraps up my brief talk. I'll turn it back over to Mike to raise any questions. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. All right, thank you both uh, for that very um, brief rundown of all the things you may not have known you needed to know about DEI and publishing. Um, we have a couple minutes left, so uh, I encourage anyone in the audience who has any questions for Vanessa or Amy to please enter them into the chat. Um, meanwhile, I will um, ask Amy, uh, recently you conducted a number of interviews for Peer Review Week with uh, journal editors and other publishing professionals uh, on uh, how they are um, embracing the future of peer review. And a lot of what you discussed with them was about diversifying editorial boards and reviewer pools. Um, in particular, uh, one video with Dr. Leonard Jack of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it, he um, is doing that's that's uh, unique in this space? Sure. Yeah, it was very interesting to talk to him. He's done a lot of work on DEI for his journal, Preventing Chronic Disease with the CDC, as you mentioned. And basically he he really emphasized how much time it takes to, to really foster a, an environment where diversity, equity, and inclusion are just part of the fabric of how the journal runs and how, how everyone makes decisions, right? So he really emphasized that there needs to be a convener and basically that is him right now as the editor in chief. And um, as I was mentioning in my talk, you know, editorial boards, they kind of need to have the editor in chief guiding um, these decisions, but he has done a really great job of continuing to stay humble, to learn, to keep everybody in the loop, you know, even, you know, students that are coming in. He has a whole um, plan to have, to integrate students into the process and to make sure that they, are seeing this environment that is inclusive of them and their input, as well as the input of the people who are very used to the scholarly uh, process and review process. So it's it's very interesting how he's working with um, many different groups and convening them together, and uh, it takes quite a quite a skill set to to kind of coordinate all of these pieces, but when they do come together and when you do have that point person that listens to every group and makes sure that the, the communication is, is open, um, really wonderful things happen. So he was saying that their impact factor has gone up, their citations have gone up, their, um, their submission quality has gone up, just diversity really does allow the journals to flourish. Right, great, thank you. There is a question from the audience. Um, how do the DEI programs overlap with or contribute to the need to mentor developing nation authors and non-English speaking authors or editors? Do we have experience? I your... would say on the K-12 side, that really comes around to drawing on authentic voices when the development of content we don't necessarily use a lot of non-English speaking authors or editors in our production simply because our market is often an English speaking market, but there is definitely space for stories from other cultures that might be written in a different language and then translated. And that's a really interesting opportunity to bring in more voices in order to enhance content. Great, 